I just urge people to give it a go. Just start. Doesn't matter how rubbish it is. Doesn't matter what it sounds like. Business of Architecture, episode 294. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. Today is the second half of my conversation with Ryan Willard, the host of the Business of Architecture UK podcast, which many of you may be subscribed to. In today's episode, we discuss podcasting for architects. Should architects podcast? And by the way, if you'd like to enter this conversation, we'd love to get your opinion on this. Should architects podcast? What podcast do you listen to? You can get involved in the conversation by heading on over to the Facebook Business of Architecture group. When you request access to that group, be sure to let us know that you are a podcast listener and we will let you write in. So without further ado, here's the second half of our conversation on Should Architects Podcast? So so far, we've talked about podcasting in terms of client onboarding. We talked about the beginning, right? Kind of educating our clients in terms of videos or content or podcasts we could send to them before the project set those expectations. We talked about podcasting as a business development medium, right? Through being able to network with people and and meet people and as a marketing medium, being able to be the expert and talk about these things in the way that uh, establishes ourselves as experts. And then you also talked about using the podcast as a medium of personal growth, actually where we're expanding our skill set because we're putting ourselves in front of people that have interesting things to share and we're learning. I'd also like to ask you questions about what are the skill sets that are involved in podcasting? The actual conversational skills, because this is the the particularly on the interview format, it is a a skill to be able to elicit conversation that's interesting from people. And how did you how did you learn that skill? Where did it come from, or how have you developed it and refined it? Mm. That is, that's a fantastic question because the answer, I think, is going to be very valuable for people. Now, I don't, not meaning to toot my own horn or anything, but people have complimented me on my interviewing skills. So, obviously, it's a skill set that people appreciate. And I think the, the compliments I do get about the podcast are, Enoch, it was amazing. You, you asked a question. They gave the answer. And I was wondering in my head uh, some additional information. And then you exact asked the exact same question. I was hoping that would be asked. So there, I have been able to build up that skill. Um, I, I enjoy doing it. Um, I actually had, I was a little side note, but I was interviewing someone who's been interviewed by NPR, right? So professional level interviewers. And when we got off the interview, he said, you are the best interviewer that I've ever had the chance to sit down with. And I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, Sally from, from the Corner Market Stories, I know I've, I've been interviewed for NPR. And I said, really? You know, tell me about that. And I was trying to think about why he said that, right? What was, and I actually asked him, I said, what, what is it about my interviewing style, the way that I interviewed that, that made you say that? And ultimately, he said it was because of the follow-up questions. Mm. Asking good follow-up questions, Right. So, to be able to ask good follow-up questions, we actually need to be listening to what the person says. And so, when I listen to interviewers, whether they're on the radio or on news stations, you can often tell when the interviewer has an agenda and they're trying to guide the, the, uh, the guest in a certain direction. Because the guest will say something that's really profound and really interesting, and I'm thinking, oh, it'd be great to dive into that topic, but then the, the interviewer switches and just goes with their next question that's on their mind. And I think that's a missed opportunity, mm. right? So, you really have to, you have to look for the hidden messages beneath what the person's telling you because there's always a story that's not being told and you need to be able to dig that up and you just do that through practice. Now, I gained that experience because I was a missionary in Honduras for mm. two solid years Wow, uh, speaking Spanish. And so, meeting with people um, in the missionary capacity that I was acting in you had the opportunity to just meet with people on their level and get in these deep conversations about life, about about um, why we're here on this earth, about a human experience. Mm. And and a large part of that is not actually preaching or, or expounding things to people, but it's listening and understanding them, mm. right? And I know that we talked about this in terms of the way it kind of relates to the client conversations. Maybe that's something we could touch on, but without going too much further... Uh, I would say that the other the other essential thing that I think that interviewers need to do that they could do better is not commenting on 
the content of the guest. This is a mistake that I see podcasters doing all the time because they're not professional interviewers is, for instance, say you give me an answer, they'll say, oh, well, that's great. I totally believe that. And here's my, my thought on that, right? The fact is, is that when I'm, a, when I'm listening to a podcast at home, I don't really care to hear the podcaster's opinion because they're not positioned as the expert, right? They're interviewing the expert. I want to see the expert expound and I want to have the podcaster dig down and even get into some of those uncomfortable questions one of my favorite interviewers is Andrew Warner, mm. and he interviews SaaS startup companies, so software companies. And I've taken a lot of my cues for interviewing from Andrew because the way Andrew interviews, he will have the difficult questions. He'll straight up ask people, so how much did you earn last year? How much is your profit? How much are you taking home? Right? These are questions that most podcasters would feel very uh, uncomfortable asking. But he's gained a reputation so guests know if they go on Andrew's podcast, he's going to ask those difficult questions. Now, a lot of times if you listen to my episodes, I have asked questions of my guests that put them in compromising situations. And it's a fine line because I don't want to get too in your face because that might scare away future potential guests, especially high-profile guests. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I want to be able to dig deep enough to give great content and value to my guests. And, and, and is there a way then that you prepare the guests for them to be able to open up like that? How do you, how do you, how do you prepare a guest for that, that, those kinds of questions? I would say the best is almost no preparation, not, not preparing the guests in that sense, because you want to ask, you want the follow-up questions almost to take them off their guard and, and make their mind go in a place where it hasn't gone before. Mm because then you'll get the best answer out of them. You'll, you'll start to get some really interesting things. Um, one of the difficult, hardest interviews I did was with Art Gensler, and um, you know the head of, of Gensler Architects, uh, architecture firm around the world. And he had just released his book, Art's Principles, and so he was used to being interviewed by the media. And so he had a certain list of talking points that he kind of had prepared ahead of time. And it was, I noticed when I was interviewing him that he would, he would just come back at me with one of his prepared talking points because my question was similar enough to the question asked by someone else that it would kind of be a scripted, um, a scripted answer. And it kind of took me off my guard as an interviewer. And it was difficult for me spinning that around and really getting to the meat of something more substantial and more interesting. Although it, he gave, gave great content. Yeah. I would have liked to have been more unscripted and kind of brought out some of those gems. Yeah. You know, so I think that the less, I don't want to say the less prepared, I would just prep them by saying, hey, look, this is a conversation. Um, uh, another thing we could say is, look, if I ask anything in a conversation that feels compromising or is uncomfortable, you don't want to answer, feel free to say, I, next question, I, I don't really feel like answering that. That's perfectly fine. You know, but that would be the extent of the preparation that I would make. Mm. And so that's really interesting. It's also, I mean, I'm thinking about my own when I'm interviewing people, how I prepare them. And you've, you've said this to me before about like listening in the conversation and trying to go deep into something that's kind of interesting when somebody said something and that you can ask why, or remember the example you gave me was be like Howard Stern. And you were, you were saying about how Howard Stern has a very playful, cheeky way of asking uh, very personal questions and he will ask the kind of the details of, 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 <laughs> of the experience that somebody was having in the bedroom, for yeah. example. Yeah. And he's unabashed about going there. Yeah. And Tell I, me exactly how they took their socks off. Exactly. You know, he'll ask, he'll just, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that kind of, that kind of stuck with me. And it, and it does require to be very present in the conversation so that you can kind of listen and, you know, you can kind of sniff out sniff out these things and again like you say it's practice it's like any any skill and if anyone's listening and thinking about you know i need to do a, a course in journalism first or you know we've all got a lot of skills conversationally anyway um with people and it's being able to get that out and documented live yeah it's it's so true and um Getting, getting rid of the fear of, the, of being on camera, you know, or being, being on, on the mic, uh, just being natural, letting your, your true self shine. Uh, the other, there's a couple other mistakes that I'd say that I see podcasters making, and it's interesting, even very highly rated podcasts that I listen to on iTunes, I can, the, 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 the interviewers sound a little off to me, because here's one thing, um, saying uh-huh, saying yes a lot, um, uh, laughing when someone makes a funny joke, because if you look at the professional interviewers, look at people like um, Larry King, you know, on Larry King Live, um, um, 
he is a blank canvas for the art that his guest is creating, right? So they're co-creating some content, but Larry isn't interjecting his opinion. He's not, he may laugh every now and then at a funny joke or something funny the guy says, but he's not saying, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, that's right. You know, kind of affirming, you know. Um, Another thing, you know, if if a guest is expressing opinion, now this is a little bit more deep if someone's going to do an interview show, but if someone's uh, expressing opinion, we don't need to say, well, that's great, that's awesome, oh, I totally agree, because that's not our place as the interviewer, right? So I do see a lot of times these podcast hosts kind of interject and it kind of, to me, it interrupts the flow of the interview and mm-hmm. the flow of the content. And what do you do when somebody is expressing an in, uh, like an opinion that you really disagree with? Or how do you, well, I've had that before, interviewing people and I'm like, I really don't agree with what you're saying here, but it's not, it doesn't feel appropriate for me to launch into my own well, that's that's a pet peeve of mine is is interviewers who have an agenda, and and I've seen a number of YouTube videos of professional people that have interviewing shows where it's very obvious that they have an agenda. They ask leading questions, they ask incriminating questions, they want to basically make their guest's viewpoint seem absurd, you know. And to me, that's totally wrong because you're you're casting. It's almost. The reason why I listen to an interview is because I want to hear from the person who's being interviewed in their own words, and I don't want to cast a judgment upon that. So if I if and it's definitely happened in the past where people say things where I just think in my head, "Wow, I pretty much totally disagree with that." You know, um, sometimes I might try to dig into their reason for thinking that, so I can gain some empathy on why they think that, and at least let them express their viewpoint about why they feel that particular way, and then I just move on. Brilliant. Yeah, and. And what is the connection between the interviewing, you touched on it earlier a little bit, the interviewing techniques or scenarios and sales and marketing conversations that we have with clients? Great, great question. Important question because to me, when we talk about, I like to call them the client conversations, right? The client conversations we have leading up to them becoming a client. It really is about listening. It really is about understanding what the person needs and what they want. And so a podcasting skill set of being able to interview comes in very handy because you ultimately, you're not going to be able to guide someone to work with you unless they feel understood. And the only way they're going to feel understood to build that liking and trust is if you listen enough to be able to repeat back to them where they can say, okay, this person gets me. Yeah. And also being able to ask why. Yeah. Tell me about that. And, I mean, when, I mean, I've been in client conversations and it's, I find it's always very powerful to understand why the client wants to do the project that they want to do. Um, for example, you know, a, a domestic project will come up and you ask the client, why do you want to have an extension or whatever? And they'll say, because we need more light and space. That's what everyone always says. They need more space. Family's growing. And you, could, and you could just leave it there. And be like, ah, okay. And I remember one particular client I was working with, or it was in a, it was in the sales conversations, um, and I was up against another architect, much more seasoned, senior practice, mature practice. And in the conversation with the lady, I was asking her questions. Well, you know, why is it important for you to have this extension? And she was saying, well, you know, the family's growing, and we want more of this, and. I was like, okay, what's the worst thing that could go wrong in this project for you? What's the absolute most awful thing that could ever happen in this project? And she says, well, that we couldn't get planning permission. And I was like, okay, why? Why is not getting planning permission, that, why would that be such a bad thing for you? And she says, because um, if I didn't get planning permission, then I wouldn't be able to have the house exactly the way that I want to have it. And I was like, Okay, so why is it important for you to have the house exactly the way that you want it? And she was like, well, at the moment, the house doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel quite like it's, it's mine at the moment. And I really, really want it to be, you know, part of, you know, I want to come home and feel like this is my own personal space. And I said again, sorry for asking the same silly question, but why is it really important for you to feel that this is your personal space? And she says, well, at the moment, it still feels like the, her husband's ex-wife's house. And I was like, ah, oh, 
okay. And in that moment, there was a definite shift in the conversation where I felt very related to her. I felt like I'd really got something deep from the conversation. It made sense why she was, that was the real driving need of the whole project. And also I felt that there was a kind of relief that she was able to share that with me and, you know, that she felt heard. And it led to, it led to a project in the end as well. And I think knowing with your clients to keep on asking why, and sometimes it's kind of scary because you feel like you're, you're, you're being evasive or you're asking too many questions or, you know, it's not none of your business or there can be a lot of that kind of mental chatter happening. But actually it's really, really important for us to understand why what the emotional reasons are for any project. And once we know that, we can, always be, um, we can always be selling elements of our design to meet that emotional need. And we can also, it deepens the relationship with the client, helps build trust. Ultimately, that trust allows us to be more expressive with the design. We can push more experimental ideas or we can, you know, we can have the client on board with more adventurous designs or we can just basically solve their problem far more adequately when we know what are the emotional mechanics behind the project. I love that, Ryan. And another powerful thing about that is then you can, every decision that you make during the project or if you're trying to convince the client to come over to your side of the fence or your point of view, if you can tie it back to what they want, then it's going to be a much more persuasive you know, argument. Right, So you might say that you want to have these windows, these windows up high to let in some light, and you could give all sorts of reasons why that's better. But if you can tie it back to the fact that it will be your own place, and you know that's where the, the pictures of the wife, the ex-wife used to be, but no, I really think that we're going to make that some windows to let in the natural light. Exactly, exactly. You know, this is, this is your space. This is very you. This is very, you know, you can, you can you, you just keep on riffing on the same on the same theme again and again and again and the clients love it you know and you love it as well because it kind of feels like you get acknowledged because you're now you're speaking the same language whereas I know you know my experience previously before that or before being interested in the human human communication aspect of architecture that if you're trying to sell your brand of building and your solutions you're often off topic and it doesn't land right and I remember that client actually I asked her when I won the job um, when I first started working I was like why did you choose me over the other architect and she said she said because you asked the right questions and the other architect just came in and it felt like a bit like a, a bull in a china shop where he was just telling us mm. do this do this do that and I thought that was very very interesting that is, and, and perhaps our clients feel that way a lot, mm. right? Because isn't that the typical, uh, that's the default. When I think back to way that I, a lot of times would interface with clients, you kind of come in there and kind of start giving them ideas, like, wouldn't it be nice if we did this? Or, hey, look, I can see we can do this with the space. And if the person doesn't feel heard and understood, that can be a problem. Yes. Right? So, Ryan, tell me what, you know, I've given you some of my thoughts on, on interviewing, and um, I would love to hear some of your thoughts on, on interviewing, especially in a podcast format, what have you found to be useful in terms of getting great content from the guests and having that conversation? Um, I do a lot of creating the space beforehand in terms of getting in rapport with the client, with the person I'm interviewing, making them feel safe, making them feel at ease. How do you do that? Fun. So I can be quite playful and I'll joke around and sometimes I, you know, you know, if I do a sound check, I'll ask them a personal question about where did you go to school or what did you have for breakfast? That one can be quite funny because then as soon as someone says, you know, I had a coffee and a cigarette, you can just turn it into a joke and a laugh. And it just makes a more relaxed space. And for me, I'm, I'm very aware that as the interviewer, I want the person I'm speaking to to feel comfortable 
and to feel relaxed and for them to not feel like it's an interview because they will open up more and I can also ask more personal questions. Um, you can go into more private things. You can go into more emotional stories. Um, and so that kind of rapport with you and the interviewer, I, and again, I've, I've kind of spoken to other people who are interviewers and I've read a bit about the art of interviewing and everyone has their own style and I'm really not there to grill somebody or to, you know, to, like you were saying, kind of my agenda is I have to remove that. I want to hear your perspective and that's the, that's the important aspect of it. So that, those initial conversations, I'll often have a phone conversation with the, with the interview person first. Um, sometimes I will send them through a list of questions, but that's really more to make them feel safe because I rarely ever, ever use those questions. And I have a list of questions that I send through because people want to prepare for them, so it's fine. And normally I won't ask any of those questions because the unprepared questions are the ones that get the best answers. Because you can kind of, like you were saying, you get people thinking on their feet or, you know, you could go down, you go down a, a story um, or they say something that's interesting. You're like, oh, tell me, tell me about that. What is, what is that? What is that? What's the, what happened there? And again, trying to have people tell stories as well. I find that's the most important aspect. And I have to work quite hard to shut up as well. Because my natural tendency is to want to be like blah, 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 and talk and, and sort of respond with my own anecdote. So learning to kind of quieten that down and just allow and just hold that space of safety for the person being interviewed to, to talk. And it can be really, really, I find it quite a, quite a beautiful thing. And I've, I've done a lot of, training and development you know personal development about around conversation and the sort of deeper aspects of human communication and like yourself you know you were talking about the being a missionary one of the um, jobs that I had in my year out as uh, as an architect is I went to Sydney and in Australia and I was an ill-prepared student who didn't bring a portfolio and thought I could just walk into an architect's office and they would give me a job for a few of course. months. Of course they would, right? <laughs> exactly. And I rocked up to these architect's offices with not much of a portfolio. I'd left it all in the UK because I didn't want to carry it with me. Um, and they were like, well, you know, we can't really give you a job. You don't know anything about Australian building codes. Um, and plus, you can only work with us for a few months at a time because of the visa that I was on. So I was forced to find work um, in another type of job and I went and became a charity advocate for, um, for the Cancer Council and so a charity advocate affectionately known in the UK as a chugger which is a kind of a mix of charity mugger <laughs> you, you're one of these guys that stands on the street and you wave people down and you get them into a conversation and you sign them up to make monthly donations for a year or so to a charity now this job was not for the faint-hearted. I wouldn't and think so. It well, it had the highest turnover I've ever seen of anything. People would last even higher than architecture school. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. People <laughs> people would last like the morning, and yeah. they were like, "That's it, I'm out of here." They'd be crying by lunchtime. Yeah, uh. and and it was really really fascinating because I, the first day I did it, and we had you have, you have like two days training, and you get your little pitch and your script. And you quickly learn that when you're out on the street, um, that that pitch doesn't work. You can't just get a conversation and just start blah, 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 talking at somebody. It doesn't work. It's got to be a conversation. And because of the nature of what I was talking about, the Cancer Council, people in Australia, there's a lot of cancer there, a lot of people have been affected by it. And people automatically assume that you've been affected by it or you know someone who's had cancer. Um, and so you've got to be able to be able to respond to that and also get into conversation. And I found very quickly in that job, I was 
I got very determined I was going to get good at it. And the first day that I was working, I managed to register somebody and then I was hooked. And I remember my mum was a counsellor. My mum's a counsellor and she was very good at asking reflexive questions. And I would go home and I'd speak with her and ask her, you know, what kinds of questions do you ask your, your, your clients or your patients or whatever? And started using some of those counselling skills in the conversations on the street with people and people would start telling you the most incredible stories about their lives and you'd have these incredibly touching experiences with complete strangers um, that were that were very very moving and I think that that experience that was the best job I've ever done in terms of learning about sales marketing interviewing and I, I, I really do advise that all architects get some sort of experience like that. Yeah, agreed. And, uh, you know, in my volunteer work, it was the same thing. So like you said, it's, it's the practice. It's being able to do it over and over and over and over and over again. And for sure, I know that doing something like standing on a street corner and, and hailing people and engaging in a conversation is definitely not for the faint of heart. Definitely not. What I'm just curious, how would you start out most conversations? Did you have a particular question you asked? Did you have a statement? I used, well, because I was in Australia, I used to put on more of a kind of faux English accent. So I'd be like, all right, darling, all right, treacle. And, you know, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be shouting that out at people. The, but the main thing was, was to be really high energy. And you cannot be affected by what anyone says to you. So people swear at you in the street. I had people saying, shouting racist things at me. Or you cannot let any of that bother you you've just got to be like you're having your own party mm. in the street you're having fun and if you can get into that state and just be like i'm having a party i'm having fun hey how's it going what are you up to and people just walk past and just keep on giving out really good vibes good energy eventually somebody would either stop or it was made it easier for them to engage in a conversation and i used to play games with people so at the time I was a young man I was in my early 20s and my favorite type of person to talk to was young attractive oh, yeah, ladies about to say an attractive 20 <laughs> something yeah exactly and I used to do a thing where I would have a little sketch pad with me and I'd see a lady walking down the street and I would walk up to her and I'd say something really cheesy like you are so beautiful you've you've inspired me to high art and I would get my sketchbook out and I'd start drawing a picture of it and she'd be walking along looking at me like you're crazy and i was like please please I'm, I'm, i feel like michelangelo at the moment i just need to capture your beauty really cheesy stuff yep. i was doing this little drawing and then i would you know after a few minutes of doing that and she's kind of like this guy's a bit a bit freaky and i would turn the picture around and it would be like a really crude stick drawing like a, <laughs> like a three-year-old had drawn it yeah. and it would always get a laugh and it would always get someone to stop and that would be the beginning of a conversation. And again, yeah. I would never pitch. Yeah. I would never pitch. Mm -hmm. I'd always get them to ask me, why are you here? What is it that you want? And try and make it, they're asking me first. Yeah. And as soon as that, it's kind of like, now I've got permission to tell you what it is that I'm doing. And that was a lot more effective than trying to stop people and, you know, shove it down there. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that it, it follows kind of human relations. They follow this particular pattern, right? There's the attention getter. You have to get someone's attention first before you do anything else, right? And then there's steps after that. But so we've covered a lot yes, today, Ryan. We have. And my goodness, this is a long episode, <laughs> but um, maybe this will be split into two. Uh, but hopefully our listeners have gotten a lot of value out of it. You know, as they've listened to us, they've probably been uh, being able to play the judge and they can determine whether they like the, the format of this particular interview. Yeah. You know, please send us any hate comments. I will <laughs> uh, send those directly to my email filter that goes to the delete rubbish bin. <laughs> yeah, but if you have any praise, send that on over. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> and if, if you go leave, we would love for any reviews on iTunes for both the Business of Architecture podcast and the Business of Architecture UK podcast. Brilliant. Right. So, we over here, I, I issue an episode a week. I know you're doing the same thing over there in the UK. So, that's basically two episodes a week that you can get in the English language to keep you busy as you're driving around and inspire you in terms of getting some good content to keep your mind busy about how to grow a more impactful practice and get your message out there. Was there anything else, Ryan, that you felt about podcasting 
that we didn't cover? No, I don't think so. I I just urge people to give it a go. Yep. Give it a go. Just start. Doesn't matter how rubbish it is. Doesn't matter what it sounds like. Try it. Just put a piece of content out there. Yeah. And when you do, let us know because yeah. we'd like to give you a shout out and give you congratulations for taking that huge step. Brilliant. All right. And that is a wrap. That's the end of my conversation with Ryan Willard about Should Architects Podcast. If you're looking for resources on building more profitable, impactful, fulfilling, and profitable architecture practice, a great place to start is my free web class that you can get instant access to by heading on over to dreampracticewebinar.com. On that page, you'll just enter in your email address and you'll get access to that free video course. In addition, you'll also get my weekly business of architecture tips delivered straight to your inbox. As always, this is Enix Sears signing off. And don't forget, Carpe Diem. Seize today.